Good day. So I'll get out of your way. Okay, so yesterday we talked about what makes something living, and who can give me a few of the highlights? What are some of the things we said? Yeah, they reproduce. Huh? That's going to be apropos today. What else? That's good. What else do we know about cells? Or sorry, well, yeah, cells. What else do we know about living things? They're made of cells. They reproduce. Yeah, good. They have to interact with oxygen. That's a required nutrient. Yep. They die. They're born and they die. They have a life cycle. Good. What else? Good. Very good. So yesterday we learned... that all living things are made of cells. And every cell is the product of previous cells undergoing reproduction. This is what we call the central dogma of biology. Does anyone know what the word dogma means? Yeah, we most often hear the word dogma in a religious context, but it's sort of like a, a, a firmly held belief. It's, it's sort of a, a position or a thing you believe that forms the framework for the rest of your life, right? So if somebody is dogmatic, they are stuck on an idea. And that idea is sort of, you know, becomes the groundwork for everything else they think, everything they do. So the central dogma of biology is that Everything alive is made of cells, and that every cell is the product of previous cells undergoing reproduction. So no cells are spontaneously coming into being. We don't make cells from scratch. Every cell is made by taking existing cells and having them reproduce. Now, we'll spend a bit of time later on talking a lot about cells. But in the short term, what can anyone tell me about a cell? I don't know what you learned in elementary school. Maybe a lot, maybe a little, maybe nothing at all. But that's okay. Like, whatever you know. But let's see what we know. Abdullah, what do you know about cells? Sorry? Oh, good. So in our blood, we have at least two different types. We have two main types of cells in our blood, red cells and white cells. Absolutely true. Um, in grade 11 biology, if time allows, I have... My wife come in and draw blood from me, and we spin it down and look at it under the microscope on the screen together. And you can see the red cells. You can't see the white cells. I've never seen the white cells. Yeah. Yeah, cells are very small. What else? Yeah, made up of different things. What do they look like? Any, like, magic school bus fans here? What do cells look like? Yeah, we tend to think of them as being circular-ish. Of course, they're three-dimensional, but absolutely. So cells are very small. They're self-contained, which means what? They are completely... 
Yeah, they're enclosed. They're completely enclosed. by a cell membrane. When you hear the word membrane, what do you, what do you think? Yeah, like, it, like an outside material. It, it's sort of material. And we tend to think membrane makes us think of something that is soft and flexible and pliable, as opposed to, say, something rigid. Does that make sense? You wouldn't think of the walls of a building as forming a membrane. Right? They're making a rigid structure. But say the surface of a balloon, you could think of as a membrane. Rubber can form a membrane. It, it is like, you know, it is usually a sealed material. You think of it as being waterproof, airproof, um, but it's, it's flexible. It can, it can sort of change shape. You know, not completely because there's pressures on it, but think of a balloon. If you push on a balloon, it'll, you know, deflect and then come back. If you let material out of it, it will change shape. If you put more material into it, it'll change shape. A balloon, the rubber of a balloon, is a really good model to think of a cell membrane. So this is a tough but flexible material. Uh, in grade 12 biology, we'll learn what it's made of. It's a phospholipid bilayer. It's kind of a relatively simple molecule compared to some of the other things in the cell. Um, but it's incredibly important. You can think of, like we said, you can picture a cell as a water balloon, really. Mean to be rude, but I'm going to check that. And oh, Miss Farmer. And good morning, Joe. Thank you for calling. You can tell she's been out of school for a while because she's texting me right during period one. Though actually, Farmer would do that anyway. In fact, if Farmer were here, she would. Well, do you guys all know Farmer? Did anyone have her last year? She's my favorite. She's my favorite person. She's also a full blown psychopath. So she'd just come down and interrupt my class and talk about music mid-period. I respect that. All right, so cell membrane is a tough but flexible material. Um, and everything that is in the cell is inside that membrane. Does that make sense? That membrane is the outer barrier. Again, if you picture a water balloon, that's a pretty good model for a cell. Everything that the cell does, it does on the inside. There may be some things on the outside. We'll talk about that. Um, cells can basically put little flags up that say, hey, this is what kind of cell I am. Those would be on the outside so other things can see it. Uh, some cells have tails that help them move. Those would be on the outside. Some cells have lots of little hairs that help them move. Those would be on the outside. Some cells have spikes that let them stick onto things and stay stuck. Those would be on the outside. But most everything the cell does happens inside the cell. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. We're going to learn a lot of the parts of the cell this year, but what I don't do, and a lot of other teachers do, and this isn't a criticism, it's just how I do it. I'm not saying this is the right way to do it or the best way to do it. I don't like to put a diagram up and put 50 parts on the cell and say, memorize these, and these are the names, and this is the Golgi apparatus, and that's the rough endoplasmic reticulum, and that's the smooth endo. I, I don't see a lot of value in that. We're going to learn about the cell as we go, by seeing some of the things it does. And every time we learn something a cell does, we'll learn all the parts involved. Does that make sense? So today, we're going to learn about how cells reproduce. So the first thing we need to know about the cell is what makes it a cell. And what makes it a cell is that it is this enclosed unit that's separate from the world around it. And it, has a, it provides a place, a safe place, for all the stuff that a living organism needs to do. And that happens inside the cell. Um, so if we were to draw a picture of this, it looks like that. Okay. And there's fluid inside the cell. We said picture a water balloon, and the fluid inside a cell is water-based, but it's not just water. Oh, oh, oh my, that was a little noisy. 
Does anyone know what the fluid inside the cell is called? Did you learn that at any point? So cell is there, and whether your cells live in water or whether they live on dry land, inside the cell is fluid. So this outer surface is the cell membrane. And then the fluid inside is called cytoplasm. Okay, now, as you study biology or any science, you'll come across a lot of words which can be very hard if you try to memorize them, all right, because there's a lot of them. But if instead of trying to memorize them, you break them down, they become easy to work with. Cytoplasm comes from two words. So inside the cell, is a fluid called cytoplasm. Um, I guess everyone here is too young to give blood, aren't you? Um, but if you give blood, you've probably heard this word before, but even if you don't, your blood has cells in it, like you said, red blood cells and white cells, and then there's also the liquid portion of your blood that allows it to flow. Does anyone know what the liquid portion of your blood is called? It's called blood... Plasma. So plasma is actually just the Latin word for fluid. So if you see the word plasma, or in this case, plasm, for some reason they have dropped the A, that just means fluid or liquid. And anytime you see the prefix cyto, that is just the Latin word for cell. Um, so you'll see cyto as a prefix fairly often in biology because cyto just means cell. So if you spoke Latin, this wouldn't be a fancy word. It literally is cell liquid. Does that make sense? It's not fancy at all. It's the precise opposite of fancy. The name just means what it is. And that is the thing you'll discover in biology. If you learn what the Latin words mean, everything is just called, nine times out of ten, it's like the color of the thing and where it is. Or the shape of the thing and where it is. Right? You just learn all these things and it's like, oh, it's like the gray stuff in the brain. Oh, that's the black stuff in the brain. Got it. Oh, that's the smooth stuff. Got it. Oh, that's the, that's the rough stuff. Got Like, all the names are just that. But they come from Latin roots. Why Latin roots and why not English? Yeah, spoiler alert, we were studying this stuff before people spoke English. So you're, we lucked out that everyone actually used the same thing, because it could be worse. Some of these words could be in Mandarin, while others could be in Persian, while others could be in Farsi, while others could be in German, while others could be in Spanish, while others could be in Italian, right? They could be all over the place. And instead, we are lucky, I guess, that about up until about what? 1,300 years ago, uh, the Romans kind of ruled all of Europe, so they took over everywhere and decent portions of Africa and Asia too. And so in all these places, people spoke their own language, but legal business was done in Latin. So it was kind of everywhere. So up until about 50 years ago, um, if you got a good high school education, it would include learning Latin. My grandfather had to learn Latin in school. They still teach it at Sir Winston, the last holdout the last school that still has a Latin class. Uh, but my wife went to university for classical languages. A classical education in, involves learning Greek and learning Latin um, because they were so widespread and so, so much of Western culture is written in them. Um, so anyway, that's why the Latin of it. You don't have to learn Latin to be a biologist, but what you'll find is there's about 30 Latin terms that you'll use so often. If you take a few seconds to remember what they mean, words start to be obvious. Cytoplasm, the liquid in the cell. Latin lesson over for today. All right. Like I said, there's also a bunch of other stuff in the cell. In the cytoplasm of the cell,
is where all the parts of the cell are found. and do their business. There's usually one other part of the cell that everyone knows. I don't know why. I don't know where this became a thing. What's the powerhouse of the cell? The mitochondria. I don't know why everyone happens to know that, but everyone seems to know that. But where's the mitochondria found? Sure you do. Where is it found? Floating around in? The cytoplasm. So that's where everything's found. Does that make sense? The cytoplasm is just a nice, safe, place for everything that needs to happen inside the cell to happen. And because of the cell membrane, it is disconnected from the outside world. Does that make sense? Stuff can be going on out here, and it doesn't disrupt what's happening in the cell as long as the cell membrane stays intact. Who's this handwritten today? And if you need some paper, there's some right over there, my friend. Right on the speaker there. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll get out of your way. Thank you. You just, next time just come up and shove me. Just be like, get out of the way. Don't actually do that. That'd be very humiliating for me. Um, yeah. So in the cytoplasm is where all the parts of the cell are found and where they do their business. We're not going to learn about every part of the cell and the business they do because there's a lot of them. But what we are going to learn about now is in roughly the center of the cell, is another membrane. that surrounds the cells nope. DNA. And by the way, roughly the center, very roughly the center, it doesn't have to be right in the middle, but we kind of picture it that way. Um, in roughly the center of the cell is another membrane that surrounds the cell's DNA. Do we know what this is called? This kind of cell inside of a cell. We have another water balloon, basically, a smaller one, inside the first one, and inside of that is all the DNA. Do we know what that's called? Well, it actually comes from a word. We have used this word before to talk about something inside of a bigger thing that exists at the center. Core is a good idea, but we've used it in our chemistry unit. In science, what do we call a small center inside of a bigger thing? Very good. Because nucleus doesn't actually refer specifically to atom. The nucleus of something is just the middle of it, the center of it, the, the core of it. Does that make sense? So core was a good choice. This is the nucleus of the cell. We could do a whole course just on DNA and the nucleus. I mean, you could do, forget one course. We, you could spend your entire life studying just DNA and the nucleus. So I don't have, oh, oh my, hello. So we don't have time to talk in great detail about it. But at its most basic, what does the DNA of the cell do? Sure. So it's instructions on how to build a cell, but not just how to build a cell, how to run and operate a cell. Does that make sense? The DNA contains all of the instructions on how to make a cell, but also on what that, how to make that cell run and operate. Does that make sense? Imagine it being, if you went into a factory, it is not only a perfect blueprint that tells you exactly how to build that factory, but it's also the full instruction manual for every piece of equipment in that factory, uh, the full instruction manual on when to the schedule, when to turn things on, when to turn them off. It's got all of that information. It is a full and complete set of instructions 
for how to build and run that particular cell. So we're going to write that. Oh, except we're going to write in blue. So the DNA isn't just read when the cell is being made, it is constantly being read. Right, right now, inside all of your cells, the DNA is being read to tell your cell how to operate, how to be the cell it's trying to be. So the DNA, the DNA is a molecule with code instructions for the building and operating And what's crazier is in a multicellular organism like you, your DNA actually doesn't just contain instructions for that cell, but the DNA contains the instructions for all the cells. So if you looked inside your white blood cell, the DNA of your white blood cell doesn't just have the instructions to make and run a white blood cell, it actually has all the instructions to make and build a brain cell, and a liver cell, and a heart muscle cell. Every single cell in your body has the instructions for the entire friggin' thing, which is pretty crazy. All right, so let's redraw our cell, shall we? So here we have the cell. And different cells have different shapes. I'm unhappy with the way that joined up. That was worse. One more try, then I give up. I give up. I wish I could go back to the first one. Actually, I can go back to the first one. Whatever, it'll do. Okay. What do we call this, the outer lining of the cell? That's the cell membrane, very good. And it's full of fluid, what do we call that fluid? Very good, the cytoplasm. It is astonishing how I'm 39 years old and I still can't color inside the lines of something. It brings me great shame. And somewhere, Miss Middleton is weeping. But that's okay. And then somewhere in the middle of the cell, we have... a second membrane. And if this whole thing is called the nucleus, and it is, what would you guess we call the fluid inside the nucleus? What do you think? The cytoplasm is the plasm inside the cyto, i.e. it's the liquid inside the cell, what do you think we call the nucleus liquid? The liquid inside the nucleus. Very good. You're 99% there. They call it the nucleoplasm. Kind of. And what do you suppose we call the outer membrane of the nucleus? This is the cell membrane, that would be the, yeah, and they use the adjectival form, so they say the nuclear membrane, but same thing. Very good. Well, but even when we talk about nuclear science or nuclear reactions, all that means is reactions where instead of the electrons reacting, which is how chemistry normally happens, Nuclear reactions are just where you hit things together so hard that the electrons fly right out of the way and the nucleus of one pounds into the nucleus of the other. That's what a nuclear reaction is, right? So there we have the cell membrane, the cytoplasm. By the way, if they called it the cytomembrane, that'd be better, but they don't. Um, and then we have the nucleus, which has the nuclear membrane and the nucleoplasm. And then inside there, and try to keep up with this beautiful art, we have uh, the DNA which I'm going to show in that color right there. 
And when we look in the cell, it just kind of looks like all these squiggles. And I regret how I've done that because I made it line up with the arrow for nucleoplasm. So I'm going to kind of avoid that so we can see which is which. And that is the DNA. Deoxyribonucleic acid. You don't need to know that for the purpose of this course. Um, take grade 11 bio, we'll learn a bit more about DNA. Take grade 12 bio, we'll learn even more about DNA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So deoxyribonucleic acid. Ribonucleic acid. Hey, do you know what the difference between them is? Take, take a look. Take a look. What's the difference between RNA and DNA? Ribonucleic acid and deoxyribonucleic acid. How would you make DNA from RNA? D mean usually if we de something, if we debone a fish, we we take its bones out. So in this case, what do we have to take off of the ribonucleic acid and oxygen? Right? It's a minor modification of the RNA molecule where they remove an oxygen, and that actually makes it stick to another one of itself, and instead of being a single strand, we get a double strand. Deoxyribonucleic acid. Anyway, don't worry about that. All right, so that's the cell. Now, I want to make clear, this is kind of the command and control center. This DNA is in there, and there are little molecules whose job is to read that DNA and take the instructions from it. And the instructions may, depending on what type of cell it is, um, so if you're talking about a muscle cell, and all of a sudden your brain starts saying, hey, muscle, it's fired, the DNA gets a message that says, hey, it's time for this muscle to work, and it starts pumping out instructions on how to make that muscle do what it's supposed to do. So think about the muscle cell, in this case, it is torque. Um, but this is the command and control center. This is not actually empty cytoplasm. There's all millions and millions of things in here doing stuff, doing whatever it is that cell does. We're leaving it empty now, not because it's not there, but because we want to learn about these things in small steps. Does that make sense? But there are millions of parts to a cell that do different things. Is that fair? That's logical? All right. So what we want to focus on today is the life cycle of a cell. Now this is highly scientific language, so try to keep up. A cell living and doing normal cell stuff is said to be an interphase. This is where a cell spends most of its life. It's just doing its thing. You can kind of think of this as the equivalent of adulthood. You're just, even like from adolescence on, you're just doing your thing. Um, so if you're a muscle cell, you're being a muscle. You're shortening and lengthening and shortening and lengthening and shortening and lengthening as needed. And if you're, a, if you're a nerve cell, you're being all nervous. You're firing those electrical impulses. You're doing your thing. Does that make sense? Whatever kind of cell you are, that's it. Like if you're a happily married cell with two kid cells in a minivan, then this is where you're doing it, right? Like you're doing your thing. When a cell is ready to reproduce, <laughs> so 
So interphase is the standard bit of cell life, but when a cell is ready to reproduce, it enters a process called, does anyone know? You might have learned it, you might have heard it. Don't worry if you haven't, I'm just curious. I'm always curious to know what people have learned, because some elementary teachers really hit this cell stuff hard, and then some don't, and that's totally fine either way. Um, Anyone know where this is going? No, that's okay. Mitosis, very good. So when a cell is ready to reproduce, it enters a process called mitosis. Now, here's the thing. I sometimes think it is helpful to imagine what mitosis would be like if people did it on a big person scale. Does that make sense? You don't have to draw this. All right. In fact, I would encourage you, look at me, I would encourage you not to draw what I'm about to draw. But we know how people reproduce, right? Which is men and women have sex and the sperm, egg, right? They make one cell and then that one cell starts growing and reproducing and becomes lots of cells, right? That's how people actually reproduce. But interestingly, um, at the cellular level, reproduction looks very different. Sexual reproduction like that, where we make a whole new organism, is a different thing. Um, and we'll talk about it a lot in grade 11 biology, we don't talk about it so much right now. But when a single cell goes to reproduce, in other words, if your body needs to make a new skin cell, there's no sex involved, right? I mean, it just makes a new skin cell. How does it do that? Well, cells don't reproduce on a small scale like people do on a big scale. Um, this would be the equivalent. Imagine if you reached the time of your life where you said, you know what? I think I'm ready to start a family. Reasonable thing to do, right? You know, I've, I've got, a, I got, I got a car, I got a house, I got a job. Ready to start a family. Does that make sense? If you were a single cell, this is what you would do. You would sit here and say, all right, here I am. Happy little me, ready to start a family. So the first thing I'm going to do is grow a second brain. So I had one brain. And now I'm going to grow a second one, but I'm also going to kind of grow it into a second head there. So now I've got two heads, right? And then while we're at it, we're going to need a couple extra arms and a couple extra legs. And then you would just casually saw yourself in half. Does that make sense? By the way, you would also have to make another heart and another set of lungs and another set of kidneys and another small intestine, another large intestine, another rectum, another, all the toes, all your fingernails. But does that make sense? But that would be what it would be like if you just started doubling all the stuff you had and then sawed yourself in half. Now, is that, is that a very effective way for people to reproduce? No, it would be weird. I mean, maybe the way people reproduce already is weird, but I think this would be weirder right? Like odd. So this is not at a big scale how we reproduce, but this is what cells do. Does that make sense? They just make a copy of all of their parts and then they cut themselves in half, which is weird. I mean, think about this. Imagine if reproducing involved cutting yourself in half. Is the original person even still there? That's right, right? Is one of the original? Are both of them half of the original, or is one fully the original and the other one's fully new stuff, right? It's weird, weird to think about, but that is how cells reproduce. Um, which means, this is weird to think about, but in one sense, you could think that like, your cells trace all the way back to the first cell that ever was, right? There's a direct line of the cell splitting in half, and splitting in half, and splitting in half. So you could trace every single cell in your body through a series of splits and splits and splits and splits, back, 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 back in time, back in time, back through before there were animals, back to when there were just plants, back before that, back to when there was just single-celled organisms, back, 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 back to the very first cell. And it's just been split over and over. Now again, for something as big as we are, but it, it would be weird, but really, I mean, it's not inconceivable that an animal could double all its parts and then split in half. You can cut a worm in half and you get two halves that wriggle around and do stuff. I don't know, would they, do they survive? I know they like last long enough that you can like 
the one is still wriggling around while you're fishing with the other half. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. But at its most basic, here's what happens. What do we call the main life stage of a cell? So the cell is born. Um, I'm going to put born in quotation marks because, of course, yeah, this you can draw. And this whole stage here is called interphase. Interphase is normal cell life. And then after interphase, we get, what's the stage where the cell reproduces? Mitosis. And so if we start with one cell with a nucleus and a bunch of DNA in there, at the end of mitosis, we have two cells with a bunch of DNA in them. <laughs> and at the beginning of mitosis, we still just have one cell. So that's the basic rundown. Does that make sense? Now, this is normal cell life. And this is reproduction. Though, if you do the thing, I mean, sometimes you just have an unexpected family. Is sometimes how things go. But, uh, but if you're planning to have a family, you might do some preparation before you actually do it, right? What are some things you might do before you decide to start a family and have kids? Or even before you decide to start a family by getting a pet, what are some of the things you might think about? What might you do? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. You might develop a drinking problem, I don't know. But putting all those things aside, like what might you do just to prepare your life? Was that dark? Okay, I'm sorry, Catherine. So you go? Yeah. Yeah, if you're going to have a kid, what might be some of the things you're going to think about? You might want a job, a house, and like you might say you lived in a one bedroom apartment and you decide it's time for me, I'm planning to have a kid. Again, that's not always how it goes, sometimes it just happens. But if you're planning, you might say, is this one bedroom apartment a good fit? I might want a, a second one. Oh, hey, is this, is this a two door, two seater sports car I'm driving a good idea for a little kid? Maybe it's time to get the minivan. You know what I mean? Like these are the choices you make. You go, I might be way too interesting and exciting right now. Is it time to get really lame? Right? Like, these might be the considerations. So, there's one thing the cell does to get ready, which is right before mitosis, The cell makes a perfect copy of its DNA. That's hard to read, isn't it? I'm going to pick a different color. Uh, that better? I don't know that that's better. That's not better. Yeah, of course. So, this is important. And, by the way, look here. I'm just hand-waving this, like, by the way, it makes a perfect copy of its DNA. Your DNA, this is weird, in every single cell, and keep in mind you have trillions of cells in your body, every single one of them has about a meter of DNA, all coiled and packed inside the cell. A meter. Millions of lines of code. All right? A massive amount of data. And so we just like hand wave, be like, oh, by the way, yeah, it just makes a copy of that. All right? It's a big deal. Um, if you take grade 12 bio, we'll learn about a little bit about how that happens. Not in all the detail, but some detail. It's a lot. It's interesting. But we're just going to say that that's one of the preparations. That doesn't happen during mitosis. 
that happens before mitosis. It's a little bit of preparation for the cell to begin its reproductive life. Does that make sense? All right. Today we're going to quickly learn mitosis at a, at a bit of speed, and then tomorrow we'll go slower with it, and we'll actually pull the microscopes out and see if we can, I have some cell samples back there where we can find different stages of mitosis. But ready? We're going to call this mitosis at a glance. It's not lowercase, it's just curvy. You've never seen a logo that has a curvy M before? about the McDonald's logo? Is that lowercase? No, it's clearly not. It's a proper name. It's clearly an uppercase M. It's just curvy. You can have a curvy uppercase M. That's allowed. This is what a curve, a cursive M looks like. Very curvy. Ah, I don't make the rules, right? Nick, leave me alone. Okay. Okay. So here's mitosis at a glance. Happens in four stages. So the first stage of mitosis is called prophase. Funny, I feel like I was just talk, talking about this because I taught grade 11 bio. Okay, in prophase, the DNA winds and coils. into tightly packed chromosomes. We'll talk about that word, but basically, if you were moving house, right? If you were moving, you'd take all your stuff and you'd put it in boxes to keep it safe, right? Well, we need to keep the DNA safe, and the way we keep the DNA safe is that instead of letting it be loose and free and flowing so it can be accessed, it coils up into these very tight shapes. And we draw them as an X because remember we said that a perfect copy has been made. So it's stuck to a copy of itself. Right? We said at the end of interphase, the DNA makes a perfect copy of itself. And so if you look here, each of these appears like an X because it's actually two copies of each chromosome stuck together. And I'm actually not going to, I'm going to draw that one here. And one other major thing happens, which is the nucleus begins to dissolve and eventually will dissolve completely. So the nucleus dissolves. And centrioles form at the poles of the cell and produce spindle fibers. Whoa, what? Don't worry. It'll make sense once we draw it all out. Basically, if you're moving your house, you would put all your stuff in boxes, you'd take them out of their rooms, and then you'd put them on moving trucks, right? That's how you move house. Well, here, we need to separate the DNA so we have one copy of it on each half of the cell so we can split the cell in half. Does that make sense? So we're going to tightly pack the DNA. We're going to get rid of the nucleus. And then we're going to make these things called centrioles, which are going to make these things called spindle fibers, which are going to go eventually attach to the DNA 
and pull it to each side of the cell. We'll label new things here. That's a centriole. That's a spindle fiber. And that's a chromosome. A lot of words, don't worry, we'll use them so much over the next couple of weeks, they'll become very familiar to you, very, you'll be confident with them. Again, remember, this is the equivalent of, I've already grown a second head, a second pair of arms, a second pair of legs. Now we're getting stuff moved so that one copy of everything is on one side and one copy of everything else is on the other side so that we can then take me and split me in half. That's what's happening here. We are now, we've already doubled the DNA. Now we're just going to get rid of the membrane around them, get rid of the nucleus. We're going to compact them so they're nice and stuck together because you wouldn't want to be trying to move DNA if it's just this big, floaty, gloopy mess. So it tightens right up to form the chromosomes. And then we form the centrioles and the spindle fibers, which are the moving crux of the cell. That's prophase. After prophase, we get a stage called metaphase. Did I go all caps there? I did not. Did I double underline there? I did not. I didn't even use a ruler. All right, in this stage, the chromosomes line up at the center of the cell. And the spindle fibers attach to the chromosomes at the centromere. So if we were to draw the cell, there it is. What color did I use for DNA? That one. So now we would find the chromosomes like this. I have a little guy there. There he is. And does anyone remember what we call these two things that we find at the poles that are going to pull the DNA to each side? These are the centrioles. They produce these fibers. Do we remember what they're called? Yeah, and I'm drawing just one, but of course, actually, it would be thousands upon thousands upon thousands, but that would make this diagram very messy. And they attach at the very center of the chromosome, which is a new word for us. We call it the centromere. Good, so let's write those down. That's the centriole. That's the spindle fiber. And I'm going to do some very high-tech zooming in. Ready? Oh, oh. Oh, that didn't go well. I, for one, am shocked. There's paper up on the speaker over there. All right, so that, these are the spindle fibers. All right, this whole thing is the chromosome, which is just the widely packed DMA. 
And that is the centromere. Again, don't stress about the words. It'll come. We will use them so often, you will get very used to them. You don't need to panic. Biology always feels, always feels like it's a million words. And then with a bit of practice, you get there. Not even practice, just exposure. It's like anything else. You get really into a squirt with a million new words, and then you know them. All right, from here it should actually be pretty obvious. What's going to happen? What's going to happen from here? We've got the cell. Before reproduction begins, it makes a perfect copy of its DNA. Then we wind those into tightly packed chromosomes to keep them safe. We get rid of the nucleus, which is normally what keeps the DNA safe. We make these centrioles that produce spindle fibers that go out and attach to the centromeres of those chromosomes. And now we should expect yeah, it's going to split them apart. And that's exactly what happens in the next stage, which is called anaphase. And in anaphase, the chromosomes split and move to the poles of the cell. That's it. We'll draw that. Oh, golly. Don't know what that was. Golly gee gosh. so humbled when I sit and look at people drawing and I'm like, I can't draw this. And then some people have like kits. They're like, it's time to draw. My day has come. And they're like pulling out like burnt umber and fuchsias and like crazy colors. It's like, it's amazing. It always brings me joy. All right. The next is telophase or telophase. I've always said telophase, but some people say telophase. The British say teleophase. I don't know. Pronounce as you like. Um, they love to add just an extra syllable in. Like what do the British call aluminum? Aluminium. Why? I don't know why. They just do. All right. A new nucleus forms on each side of the cell. So a new nucleus forms on each side of the cell as the cell membrane begins to cleave at the center. All right, we get a formation of something called the cleavage furrow, which is literally that it pinches in 
All right, so the membrane will start to pinch in, pinch in, pinch in. And if you can imagine, if you had the ability to fuse rubber, if you could heat it up, if you had a balloon and you pinched it in, pinched it in, pinched it in, pinched it in, you could eventually, uh, you know, if you got it hot enough, melt it together and then cut it, and you could turn one kind of party balloon into two party balloons. Can you kind of picture that? That's what happens here. So uh, we get this happening. And we get, what color did I use for the nucleus way back? Blue. Why wouldn't I have used blue? All right. So we get the formation of a new nucleus, and we get the beginning of cleavage. We get the beginning of that separating of one cell into two halves. Literally, again, just by the membrane folding in on itself. And then outside of mitosis, cytokinesis, is the last step, which for whatever reason, and I've never really understood this, one of these days I'm going to look it up and get a better sense, is this is considered to have happened after mitosis is done. I guess mitosis is all about the nucleus. It's all about DNA. And this is where the one cell actually splits into two daughter cells. I don't know why. Seems gender, doesn't it? Seems sexist. Not sun cells. But that is the accepted language. Yeah, offspring cells. Child cells. Now listen, tomorrow I will give you a nice copy of this with diagrams that are already printed out, but I think there is tremendous value in drawing it out. I think forcing yourself to draw it out makes you kind of think about what's happening at each stage. Now the crazy thing about this is tomorrow we'll uh, throw one of the microscopes up on the screen and you'll actually see um, we have some slides prepared of cells that are in a highly reproductive region of a plant. And you can actually see the cells at all these different stages. You'll see some cells in prophase. You'll see some in metaphase. You'll see some in anaphase. And it's visible. Um, not the easiest thing in the world to see, but it is visible. So these are the stages. Put that away. Right away. Right away. Right away. Right away. Right away. Thank you. Is that a thing that you just do in other classes when a teacher is right next to you and they like, are OK with that? They don't freak out. I'd freak out. I did freak out. Anyway, um, so um, your first assignment in this unit is going to be to sort of make some sort of creative representation of it. So I'll give it to you tomorrow. So I'll give you kind of a preview of that today. I've had people do like a little flip book animation. So you just draw the four stages nicely. Um, I had somebody once do, and I swear I've lost this video somehow. I've got to find it. Somebody did a stop motion animation once, the collapse scene of it for me, and it was incredible. It was so profoundly impressed. Yeah. It would be incredible. Be my hero. Um, I had somebody make me like a mobile one, like, you know, that would go like above a baby's crib. And they used uh, like flat, like clear plastic, I don't know what they were, like kind of eggshell things that could come apart. And I actually like them. I've had some really cool ones for these. For the record, you don't have to do something really cool. You can get all the marks. Hey, hey, 
Wait, really? Yeah, I forgot. Settle down. I'm gonna spill my coffee at you. That's what I'm gonna do. Um, don't be cold now. You'd be fine. Uh, I wouldn't be fine. I'd get fired, but you'd be fine. But it'd be worth it. Anyway, um, so yeah, you don't have to be highly creative, but it's nice when you are. That'd be cool. Um, you can, like, listen, and I'll tell you right now, I wasn't highly creative when I was in high school. I'd have been like, I'm just going to write the stages out on a piece of paper and go out and I'd be a 72. And that's fine. But you can start thinking if you want. What's a cool way I could show this? But this process is happening in your body constantly. Some cells um, don't ever do this. You know, your brain cells uh, don't reproduce. Once you are an adult, you have every brain cell you're ever going to have for the most part, just a few exceptions, and they are locked in interphase. They don't reach mitosis. They don't reproduce and make new ones. Um, in fact, most of your cells don't. Most of your cells um, are destined just to die. We don't let any of our cells, this is actually important, look here. I got four minutes and I'm gonna use them. We don't let any of our cells that are in contact with the outside world reproduce because there's danger if they're in contact with UV light and chemicals and insects and bacteria and fungi that their DNA could be damaged, compromised. Does that make sense? So even when you want to make new skin cells, we don't let these skin cells reproduce. They are potentially damaged. We just let them die. It's the dust in your house. Right? It's just your dead skin cells floating off. When we want to reproduce, we have special cells that we keep below our skin that we keep safe. And we use those ones to undergo this process and constantly make new cells. Does that make sense? We don't actually let the blood cells in your blood reproduce because they also are coming into contact with nutrients and chemicals and hormones and things like that. We keep cells in the bone marrow nice and safe, protected, and they produce new cells for your blood. Um, but constantly in your body, this is happening, where you have cells whose whole job is to sit there and get ready, and then they duplicate their DNA, and then they dissolve the nucleus, tightly coil it, connects to spindle fibers, gets pulled to each side, forms a new nucleus, and splits in half.